great. Um, thank you very much. So I'm actually really excited today to share with you an ongoing project that I have with my collaborator, John, um, to really use artificial intelligence to see if we can learn something new about the data that's in one of our largest national registries for FSHD. So the registry that we're using is the National Registry for Myotonic Dystrophy in FSHD. It's housed at the University of Rochester. It began in 2002, and currently there's over 2,600 individuals in that registry, including around 1,000 people with FSHD. It has up to 17 years of follow-up for some of these individuals, and so it really represents one of the um, largest and in, in, uh, most complete longitudinal data sets that we have to look at for people with FSHD. The inclusion was really broad, so just either a clinical diagnosis or genetically confirmed FSHD or myotonic dystrophy. This was based on a chart review, so everyone does have a, an initial chart review um, before they enter the registry. Then after that, people fill out an annual survey. So most of the data that we'll be presenting on is, is patient reported. So we're not having people come in and we're not evaluating them. We're really relying on people to give us the data that we'll be analyzing. There's a really a, a large number of questions about the clinical history, medical conditions, medications, the muscular dystrophy uh, history, the need for other devices. And what I'm showing you here is just on the yearly survey, and you can see this is looking at the need for assistive devices. So these are sort of hard motor transitions for people, things like using braces, a cane, a walker, or having to use a wheelchair. For the AI project we're describing today, we really included people who had genetically confirmed FSHD1. We did this because of numbers. This is by far the largest percentage of people in the registry, about 95%. And when you look at um, the pure number of fields of information that we have to analyze, there's really over 180 separate data elements. And if we add medications, it's many thousands. And so this is a large set of data to be analyzing. So when we look at the individuals in here, we have 578 individuals and we have an average of nine years of follow-up. This is just a, an amazing resource. Many of you, who are listening may actually have participated in the registry. And so this is your data that we're showing. And so I think this is just really a fantastic resource. Um, when we look at the people who are involved, the average age is middle age, so around 56 years. You can see on the bottom, le bottom left what's called a histogram. This just bends people by decade. You can see on the x-axis and it shows you the number um, for each decade. And so you can see the average is middle-aged, but we're really spanning the full uh, uh, lifespan of individuals from very young to very old. Um, there's slightly more men than women, and we're mostly uh, Caucasian and non-Hispanic. Over half of people have a college education or beyond. And so there's this notion of, of something called a registry bias. So whenever we're thinking about a registry, we always have to ask this question. How long, how well does the registry population represent the broader group of people with FSHD? Because there's this question of whether a certain type of individual is more likely to complete or enter a registry. And there's some classic examples of this where people will say are, who are older are more likely to have time to join the registry. Um, sometimes people who have a, a higher impact of FSHD on their lives might be more inclined to do it. When we look at the data we have here, indeed, we do see a population that's perhaps a little bit older. And if we look at the demographics, you can see that we're not really matching the US census data for the breakdown of race or ethnicity. And so um, it's not clear if this is a bias in the registry or rather this reflects the true FSHD population. And the trick is, there's really no way for us to check because this is one of the largest data sources that we have. So we don't have another data source to compare it against. When we look at the clinical characteristics of the people who are enrolled, I think this matches actually pretty well with other large studies in the US, but also large registry studies where they've published their information. You can see that people are having symptoms start at around 22 years of age 
They're getting diagnosed around 32 years of age. This leads for a gap between when their symptoms start and they're getting diagnosed of about 10 years. We collected information about genetics. So just as a reminder, the genetic mutation in FSHD1 is a deletion of these repeated units that are on your fourth chromosome. We say people who are unaffected have more than 10 of these repeats. People with FSHD type one have between one and 10. Some of you may be going, well, wait a minute. When I look at my commercial test, it doesn't say repeats, it says kilobases. And the reason it says that is to do the commercial test, they cut out the region of DNA where the mutation's occurring on chromosome four, and they report back the size of it. But there's an easy way to convert kilobases into number of repeats. When you look at the distribution across those different mutation sizes, this is fairly characteristic for a US population. Typically, a minority of people have between one to three repeats, and the vast majority are in that four to 10 repeat range. When we look at what initial symptoms people had, I don't think it's that surprising that the two most common answers we got were facial weakness and shoulder weakness. And when we look at the number of people who reported that they were having to use a wheelchair at any point um, during the day, you can see 23.7 percent said they were using this. And I want you to keep this in mind. Wheelchair use is the outcome that John's going to be talking about when we start to get to what we were doing with AI. We were predicting whether people needed to use a wheelchair. And if you think back, you may remember at some point, someone may have told you some figure like around 20 percent of people over 50 may require a wheelchair for FSHD. And that comes from another registry um, in the Netherlands. And so you can see it's fairly consistent across these different registries. So the next question is, what can we learn beyond these basic baseline characteristics um, from data like this? And so one question we may have is, you know, what are the association of one item with another? And I often start with the idea of something that may be there at birth, that may have some predictive value on what to expect over the course of a lifespan. The two obvious um, examples for this would be gender or mutation. And for the purposes of this talk, I'm going to really center on mutation. And the first thing I would say is we can make a statement that says there's a relationship between the mutation and the age of diagnosis. And what I've shown you here is the simplest way to look at it. This is just a scatter plot. On the x-axis is the mutation with one repeat on the left, 10 on the right. On the y-axis is the age of diagnosis. Each of those dots is an individual. And for right now, I want to ignore the colors. We'll come back to that. So the first thing you might say is, well, there does appear to be some relationship with larger allele sizes or larger number of repeats associated with an older age of diagnosis. And indeed, we can draw a line across here. And the degree to which those dots fall along that line, that's the precision with which that mutation is actually predicting or associated with the age of diagnosis. And while there's a relationship here, you can see there's a huge spread around any one of those mutation sizes which tells us that there's got to be other factors besides mutation, which may be explaining when someone is diagnosed. And so looking at this, you may even go, well, it's hard to even understand what is the effect of the mutation on the age at which people are being diagnosed. And one way for us to try to make it easier to understand is to take the same data, but present it in a new way. And I want you to think about this because when John's talking about AI, AI actually does the same thing. It has different tools for looking at things in different ways. And so what I did here is I kept the mutation data, but I binned it. So this line on the left, this is people with one to three repeats. The middle line is people with four to seven. The line on the right is uh, eight to 10. The age of diagnosis now is along the bottom or the x-axis. And this is a probability plot. And so what it's showing us is the percent of the population for each of these different groups who's been diagnosed by a certain age. And if you draw a line 
right at 50%, this gives you a value that we often report to people. It's the middle, the median. It's the value at which 50% of people will be diagnosed. And if we look at this, suddenly the effect of the mutation on the age of diagnosis becomes much clearer. You can see for one to three repeats, it's 14 years, but it goes up as we look at the larger number of repeats, 30 years for four to seven or 40 years for eight to 10. So coming back to our original scatter plot, what if we wanna ask a question that's slightly more complicated? Now we wanna think about how do three clinical items interact with each other? Well, it gets a little harder to do, but we can do it. And so what you can see here now is the colors on this graph. The colors represent different areas of the body that were first affected when people had symptoms. And I'm not gonna go through all the colors, but I wanna point out two that I think you'll be able to see are quite common. The blue dots, which represent facial weakness, and the light green dots, which represent shoulder weakness. And now you can see we can start to formulate slightly more interesting clinical, they're really hypotheses, statements that we probably would still need to prove were true. You can see there's a clustering of blue on the left and a clustering of green on the right. And so we get to the point where we might be able to make statements like this. People with a small number of repeats are often diagnosed younger and more likely to have facial weakness as a presenting symptom. While on the other hand, People with a larger number of repeats are often diagnosed at older ages and more likely to have shoulder weakness as a presenting symptom. And so you can see that as we add items, our understanding is getting more detailed, but it's difficult to do because there's really a limit of how many items we can add in this traditional type of analysis and still understand what we're looking at. Now, before I pass this back off to John, I do want to take a minute to talk about wheelchair use because wheelchair use is going to be the outcome that he's going to be using AI to help us understand. And we can think about wheelchair use a couple different ways. You can think of it as a binary item. Either people said, yes, I'm using a wheelchair, or no, I'm not using the wheelchair. But you could also think about this as an item that might be distributed over time, in which case maybe what we're looking at is the age at which someone first uses a wheelchair. What I'm showing you a graph for on the right here is similar to the prior graph I showed you where we have age of first wheelchair use now on the y-axis, the number of repeats, the mutation again along the x, Again, I think you can see there is a relationship, right, with people with smaller number of repeats tending to need wheelchairs at an earlier age, but still a considerable amount of variability. So items that we don't understand that are impacting this. We can also think of this in two different ways in terms of time. Cross-sectionally, we could ask how many people said that they were using a wheelchair during the first survey. This would be a notion called prevalence. You could also think of this again longitudinally or spread out in time, in which case we're gonna say, if you answered no on the first survey, what was the risk that you changed that no to a yes over that average of nine years of follow-up? To start with for our AI project, we really thought of this in a cross-sectional fashion. We said, what were the factors that could predict someone saying, yes, they were using a wheelchair use that was in the other data that we um, collected? And so we, what we want to look at when we're thinking of a data set that's so rich, like the registry, is all of the data, not just one or two items. As we add more variables, it becomes much more difficult to understand all these possible um, interactions. Using techniques like machine learning or AI 
offers us the possibility of evaluating a large number of pretension details and their association, our relationship with different outcomes of interest. As I mentioned, we're going to be talking about wheelchair use a little more today, but we could also look at other things like a loss of job due to FSHD or someone's functional abilities and how they change over time. And so what I'm gonna do is stop here. Um, if we have time, I can take some questions um, or we can just go on uh, to uh, let John continue the talk. Yes, so if there are any questions, we can post them uh, in the Q&A section. Um, but you know what, it might take a while for people to do that, so. Um, I've got just one question that came over from Facebook Live um, that's specific to, to Jeff's talk. Um, are you referring to next generation sequencing? Um, so, right, that, that's a very good question to start with. Um, when we think of the genetic test for FSHD, the current commercial genetic test that we have does not use next generation sequencing. It's actually using a much older technique we call a southern blot. Um, and what it does is it cuts out a piece of DNA. It puts it on a gel. It runs some electricity through it, and it sees how far it moves, and that gives you a size or a weight of the fragment of DNA. And that's the result. It's often presented back to people in kilobases. Um, and that would be our current um, commercial test for FSHD. Great. All right. Um, good. I think, um, oh, here's, let's see, one more. Possible. Um, oh, okay. There's a question about how to translate kilobytes to repeats. We have, um, that gets into a little arithmetic. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we have the formula posted on the, uh, our website under genetic testing. So if you go in there, there there's actually, it tells you how to plug in some variables. So I think that might be the best way to answer that question. <laughs> All right, well, why don't we move on to John? So. Okay. John's sailing in the ocean right now. I am in Maine <laughs> last summer. All right. Hopefully you can see my screen. Not yet. Let me try again. There we go. Okay, awesome. Yeah, I have a slow connection here today for some reason. Okay, so thanks for the intro. I'm going to dive into AI, and I'm going to be actually speaking to two groups here. One is the uh, techies out there uh, who are interested in the science of AI, and the other, of course, are, are those who uh, want to see the results of this study. And here's a famous uh, AI computer scientist, probably one of the most famous, Ray Kurzweil. And uh, I believe he's working for Google now, but he's been in this field for 40 years. And basically what he's saying here is, look, computers and AI, they're part of humanity. You know, they're not standing by themselves. They're, you know, not ready to take over the world. Uh, we've created them and they do work for us. And um, not only do they do work for us, they help us understand each other and what's going on with, you know, uh, everything that concerns humanity and technology and just everything. So we're not talking about the Terminator here. And just to clarify, uh, AI in this context is something called machine learning. It's not artificial general intelligence. And, you know, that's, you know, the, the, that's uh, what Hollywood loves to portray in, you know, every movie where, you know, AI is coming to take over the world. Uh, this is artificial intelligence machine learning and it's you know somewhere between science fiction and reality and when you look at what machine learning does and some of the pred predictions it can make sometimes it does seem like magic and um you know it is really not magic it's just science fiction or it's just uh, statistics and math um it's it's about learning really so ai is about learning about data and automatically finding out patterns that might exist within that data that humans 
you know, can't see. And it might be just the complexity or the, the amount of data or the number of features of the data. Uh, but, you know, this is what computers are great at is sifting through just, you know, mountains of, of information and figuring out, you know, what is important. And we call that signal. So we look for signal in the data. Um, some of the common things you know about, um, well, Alexa and Siri both use machine learning and AI to understand human language, which is actually incredibly complex. Um, and, you know, a simpler thing to do with ML is uh, predict a stock price. So what's, what's your favorite stock going to be in six months? Um, and there's, there's plenty of programs out there that uh, you can download and run and they're open source. So you can run them on, on your machine to, to figure out things like that. And so just, you know, another slide sort of brings it home. When computers were invented, uh, they just counted things. You know, you, you know, whether it's, you know, how much money you have or um, widgets in a factory, all they did is just count one, two, three, four, five, and maybe some simple arithmetic. arithmetic. Well, that quickly led to the programmable systems era, which really is still here, but is ending. You know, so about the 1950s to current, um, you would have a guy sitting in a lab, probably had a tie, you know, and a white shirt, and he would type instructions into the computer that would do more complex things. You know, not only would they count and maybe do some arithmetic, uh, but they might have an if-then-else statement. So if a certain criteria were met, uh, the computer would branch and run a completely different calculation. So it started to work intelligence, you know, into the system. Uh, but that, you know, those programs are only as good as the programmer. And when you rolled out a new program, that was the best it was ever going to be, right? It never got better unless the programmer, you know, rolled out a new version. Well, with this new era called the cognitive systems era, the computers are automatically starting to, to improve themselves. Right, so this is a tough concept to wrap your head around, but uh, the computer can self-organize and um, understand its its strengths and weaknesses, and then compensate for its for its weaknesses. And for our purposes, um, the computer will self-organize data in order to understand uh, patterns. And so that's really the start of our project. Um, can we use or could we use AI? to create a prediction of whether a patient, an FSHD patient, will end up needing a wheelchair at some point in their life. And you know, as Jeff said, this is sort of a binary thing. Either you're going to end up in a wheelchair, and by the way, I'm a patient uh, as well, or you're not going to end up in a wheelchair. So what does that progression look like? What can predict that uh, progression? Um, and it's extremely variable. So people in the same family, you know, more impacted than others. Well, we're gonna use this thing called ML. And um, by the way, we're gonna look at uh, FSHD type one and um, those folks uh, in, you know, anonymized, by the way, uh, that have a DNA confirmation of that because we want to look at, you know, potential DNA predictors, you know, as Jeff said. Well, we can, okay, we can literally go through the 189 features that exist in this data set. Uh, we can look at them individually, we can look at them in combinations, and we can start to impute different features uh, from, uh, uh, new features from this data set. Um, and they won't be visible to the naked eye. So, you know, what we find here could look shocking, it won't, you know, a scientist, even a, a team of scientists, you know, sitting down may not be able to view, you know, what the computer is about to find. And really our best, our best outcome uh, that I would be extremely happy to is uh, to find some hypothesis. You know, maybe it's, maybe it's this combination of, of features in the data set uh, that look like it has predictive value that then we could go out and you know begin to investigate to see why you know and these would be you know potentially new hypotheses
So, you know, some combination of BMI or, you know, body mass index plus age plus initial symptom, you know, might be indicative of, you know, potential wheelchair use. Well, how do you get there? So, like I said, humans are highly involved in AI and you have to prepare the data. So, you know, in the computer world, uh, old saying, garbage in, garbage out. Well, you have to make sure that you're not inputting garbage into the AI program because it just, you know, it won't work. So um, you have to go through, ensure that the data has no missing values, that you know, there's not weird outlier values that don't make sense, and you have to scrub them out. So we call that the, the data prep, you know, data exploration. You run some visualizations. Uh, the, the diagram that Jeff showed with initial symptom you know, by color, you know, by small allele is an example of visualization. So you know, our data scientists, um, went through and, and uh, ran these visualizations to get familiar with the data. So we prepped the data, we got it ready. Uh, we also imputed some new variables, like the duration of undiagnosed time or the duration of you know, the person's uh, disease. is isn't natively in the data set, but we calculated it. So once we understand the, the data, um, the data scientists or the AI scientists will select a family of algorithms. And you know, for the, the propeller heads out in the world here, um, we're looking at supervised machine learning. So things like random force classifiers. Um, and so that model selection is very important uh, because that's you know, one of the key indicators of finding information in the data. And then these things, you know, they don't just run. You just can't set them loose and okay, yeah, you know, sift through the data and come back to me in you know half an hour and you know tell me the answer. Well, you got no, you can't do that. You have to hyper. You have to tune the hyper parameters. So you have to tell the algorithm how to operate, and that's part of the data scientist's uh, job. And probably the the hardest thing is once we do have an answer. And by the way, I'll show you a model here in a minute. How do you interpret that? You know, let's say uh, body mass index is an important feature or finding or predictor of wheelchair use. Well, what does that mean? Well, um, is it because uh, the person was all, you know, already had a high body mass index and therefore they need a wheelchair or, you know, are they in a wheelchair? So now they have a, a higher body mass index. So you have to work through all of these questions. And by the way, I think, you know, we will get to a model that will have a high accuracy prediction. And eventually, could we deploy that into a clinic to give people an idea, you know, new patients an idea of the severity of their progression of, of this disease? And the answer is, yeah, maybe. I think, you know, I think that might be a, a good value add uh, outcome. All right, so this is a very dense slide. And um, I'm going to break this down for you slowly. Um, this is a picture of the outcome of an artificial intelligence machine learning experiment. And I think you can probably see my mouse. So this is a program called H2O AI. And uh, the experiment is looking at the FSH data set uh, without age involved, the age of the person, and without met. Um, uh, all the the medical information that might exist for you know all the all the patients out there, and down here you can see uh, this is an accuracy statement. So it's saying using an algorithm called LightGBM and uh, and analyzing these features, we have a 0.8 accuracy or 80% accuracy, which is it's pretty awesome, actually. So with 80% accuracy using these features, we can say if a, a person's going to be in a wheelchair or not. So the features here are, well, when was the person diagnosed? That's the initial age of diagnose, uh, uh, sorry, of symptoms. What is the body mass index? What is the diagnosis age? You know, quite different, as Jeff pointed out. Um, and what's the length? What's the duration of the person before they were actually diagnosed? Like for me, it was 50 years. Other people, it might be almost immediate. 
uh, what was the initial symptom? Um, do they have arthritis? So you have your comorbidities here. There's some, we have some meds in here. So are they, you know, you know, is the group taking NSAIDs? Well, if they are, then you'll see sort of a number next to all of these features, which is the contribution to um, the prediction. So for NSAIDs, it's 0.25. For BMI, it's quite high. It's, um, it's almost a perfect indicator along with an, a, you know, initial age. But all of these things contribute to the accuracy uh, of, this, of the uh, prediction. And so the beauty of this auto ML is uh, it can run through you know, these features and pick them out you know, using its model. And, and then we're picking these out from you know, over 180, 100, actually 190 uh, different features. And so that's, that's a quick example. And uh, you know, I think that's, that's one of our early experiments. We'll get even above 80% accuracy in predicting wheelchair use. You know, we'll get close to probably 85%. And then from there, we can say, okay, well, why did BMI or why did uh, initial age or why did that dur uh, duration you know, between diagnosis and, um, I'm sorry, initial symptom and diagnosis, why does that matter so much? Um, and so we had a great data set here, you know, it was 578, you know, uh, uh, entries, but AI loves data and, you know, 578 is sort of a, uh, to, to the computer, it's sort of a small data set. So if we could get more records from other registries, you know, perhaps, you know, the UK or other international registries and combine those with this registry, we could potentially get the higher accuracy or potentially find new things that are predictive. And so we, get, we give that AI more fuel. And so I think that's one of our action items is, you know, how do we reach out to others you know, around the world, other registries around the world and, and have them collaborate with us. And then, so I touched on supervised machine learning, which is sort of the uh, bread and butter of the AI world. Well, but can we use more advanced algorithms to find even you know, more information? And the answer is absolutely. You know, we can go out and look at neural networks. Um, we can use even newer techniques, you know, uh, adversarial networks um, to, to dive in. And you know, that's on our agenda here as well. And as I said, you know, could we get to an algorithm you know, which is predicting you know, not only if you know, the the patient is, you know, will end up in a wheelchair, but also, you know, what will that age be and what's the probability uh, of that actually occurring to a very exact um, uh, level. So there's, I know that was a really quick sort of whirlwind tour through the, what we're doing with the registry with AI, and there's so much more to talk about. Um, uh, but, you know, for, the registry itself, you can go out to the University of Rochester's website and it describes, you know, all the information, you know, and it's sort of a context of a patient. And, and I believe that's where you join up. And, you know, I guess I would encourage you, as I said, uh, <clears throat> if there's anybody listening who hasn't joined uh, the registry, please go ahead and join. Because like I said, AI loves data. And the more data we have, the more accurate the the uh, the predictions and the success of the projects. So June, I guess that's, that's all I had. Uh, if, you know, anybody would like to answer, ask questions, I'll try to answer Great. in the chat. Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, there are um, a variety of questions, um, somewhat random order, but um, uh, actually the first one is, is really about the um, way the registry collects data. And this is from a patient who says, um, the questionnaire needs to be online. Um, I haven't answered one for many years. So I guess this is someone who initially originally enrolled and just, you know, found the paper questionnaire too much of a bother to um, deal with. So um, that's a good question. What, what's, what are the prospects for getting at least that data collection online for patients? And could that help? increase the number you know people who participate yes the answer is 
Sure. That would be an ideal scenario. I think, you know, everything in life um, takes a little bit of money and a little bit of time. I think right now the registry is working on that transition. The hope would be in the next year or two that they'd be able to migrate over to an online system. Um, but, you know, I think of it this way, it's really a resource for all of us and all of us may end up having a part in the ability for that registry to migrate over and, um, you know, be available um, for us to continue using an electronic format in the future. Um, so we may, you may be hearing more about this in the next year or two. I see a question in the... Um in the chat, and I think this is directed at John. John, is any of this published as a scientific report? Not yet. So we're so early in the, the process. We've only been working at this for a couple of months, but a, the plan is to, you know, understand the, the outcome of this, this AI experiment and, and to publish, yes. So we'll have several hypotheses and, and we're actually, you know, doing some, you know, standard quote unquote statistical methods and and so we're looking at publishing also the, the interplay between, you know, how does an uh, epidemiologist or a biostatistician work with the, you know, outcome of the AI and how does the AI get, improve, you know, based on a, on a statistician's work. So yes, uh, you know, long story short, in the, in the coming months we'll be publishing. Excellent. Um, I do have, I think this is probably a question for Jeff, Dr. Statland. Um, from Facebook Live, actually. Many folks use a roll later. Does the questionnaire reflect that as an auxiliary aid? Um, the, right, the questionnaire as it's, it's currently created was uh, exactly what I showed in the picture, which really doesn't. It just has a walker, um, and that's gonna lump in rollators, four point walkers, and all the different varieties that are there. Um, I think a valid point. Um, we could expand it. It's always a balance, though, between asking too many questions to where people don't really have the time to fill out a questionnaire um, versus enough so we can get important information. And so I think that's probably the balance that was going on when they chose the current format. So we have a question um, about, oh, I think you mentioned it before, that how many people are in the National Registry? with FSHD, I guess. Right, so um, my understanding about a thousand. Right. Currently, um, it used to be about 50% had genetics and 50% didn't. There's been an effort to try to make genetic testing available to people in the registry. So it's probably more like 60, 40 now. Mm -hmm. But I think about a thousand individuals. Right. And for this analysis, did you um, include all FSHD, even if they did not have a genetic confirmation, or did you restrict it for genetic Yeah, it was, genetic for this first test, it was restricted to people with a genetic test. This was largely because, John, I think we had decided we wanted to add genetics as a potential modifying mm -hmm. you know, risk factor for FSHD, and so we needed to have the inflammation. Right, so my understanding is there's I mean, the FSHD Society has funded an initiative to try to get some of those other, as many of those other patients who haven't had genetic testing to get confirmed. And that would be, you would think would be a, a kind of a low hanging fruit <laughs> to expand the amount of data. Just get, if those people would just um, agree to get the testing, which is being avail offered at no cost to them. Um, so if there's anybody out, they're listening who's in the registry and hasn't been genetically tested, please take advantage of it. All that data you've been contributing will be so much more valuable if you just checked off that yes <laughs> box. Um, do you have any insight? I mean, I guess it's hard to know because maybe these 400 or so people who are in the registry haven't really responded. So you don't know why they're not responding. Do you have any insight into that so we can maybe develop a stronger message to get people to... Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't have insight into it. I know the program's been going on for two years and thank you and thank the, uh, I think Friends of FSH yeah. who have been helping with this for um, funding that. I think it's a great opportunity. Um, 
we probably could make it easier um, if the genetic testing becomes easier, but that's probably a, a topic for another another sequester. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. Um, there's a question here. Are there any genetic features included among predictors? So, I mean, there's the repeat length, but this person is asking specifically about SMCHD1 gene sequence, and could that have a predictive value um, considering the, you know, the theory that FSHD1 and FSH2 are to, I guess, there's an interaction there between the SMCHD1 gene and the ducks, you know, the D4Z4 repeats. Um, so, yeah, I think the question is, do you have the data for that that could be part of the analysis? Um, the short answer is no, not in this data set. All we have in this, mm -hmm. this set is the commercial test. Now, we have whether or not people have been tested for SMCHD1, but it's a very small number right now. Okay. Uh, I'm afraid John, Horgan, uh, John Hogan has a hard stop right now, so if he has to sign off, I want to make sure we thank him um, for, for his talk today and for his stepping forward to collaborate on this really fascinating project. Yay. <laughs> All right. So, um, okay. Thanks. No, thank, thank you. Jim. you. It was a, a pleasure presenting. And if there's any follow-up questions, just let me know. Okay, great. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much. Bye. Um, okay. We have another question here. Um, that how many other registries exist around the world? It's a very good question, and I know that there's there's several several groups, including the FSHD Society, have been um, very interested in this topic. There are a lot of registries. There's several large ones, and registries take multiple forms. For example, if someone has a mailing list, that's a type of registry, but all that's in it is someone's you know email address or their phone number. Um, and so there's been an effort that's been going on for several years to try to consolidate some of the registries, or if not consolidate them, come up with what's called a core data set that can help inform the highest impact data that they could be collecting in the registries. There's been a, an actual published paper um, dealing with this, but um, I think part of this project was really meant and John's been working on this piece very hard to, to identify what, you know, what are those key elements that we should be telling people they need to collect in all these different registries. And so we're hoping that one of the outcomes of this project will be uh, us sort of validating some of the assumptions people have made about what's important and identifying some other information that may be equally important that's not currently being collected in all the registries. Mm -hmm. Uh, this June, is a... feel free to add to that. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, well, we can, uh, that's a work in progress. <laughs> and uh, I have a question here, uh, almost a philosophical one, but maybe there's a sort of a kind of medical perspective on it from someone who says, why would we want to know that we will eventually need a wheelchair? I'm glad I didn't know for 25 years. Um. Well, I, I mean, I, that's, a, I, that's a fantastic question. Um, I think there's several reasons why we might want to know. And, you know, there's, there's one side, and I think the side you're, you're thinking about, which is what, you know, what can I expect over the next 10 years or 20 years of my life? And that's, that's the idea of somehow these models are predicting something. But there's something else that I think is equally as important and maybe more so that uh, analysis like what John did is gonna give us because he's starting to come up with other factors that are associated with having to use a wheelchair that are modifiable. Things like our body mass index or our other health conditions where we can do something about it. And so maybe this is just a call to us on in two different ways that by having better medical we may be able to slow down something that's happening to someone, or if someone's in a wheelchair, maybe we need to be more aggressive about our medical care. And so we're going to learn a lot about doing an analysis like this, not necessarily just what it's going to uh, predict for an individual. Does that make sense? Uh, yes, very much so. Um... It touches on a question I had, because uh, the BMI, uh, the body mass index, correlation was 
intriguing and it's it's do you have any hypotheses about that cause or effect or maybe both <laughs> yeah and, and that's again a fantastic question i thought john was dealing with that quite well because the problem with it is um, from a study like this where we really just look at a single single time point whether something's affected with an answer yes and no it doesn't tell you the temporal relationship so it doesn't tell you was a high body mass index making someone need a wheelchair at a sooner time or whether someone was having trouble you know walking and getting around so was doing less physical activity and gained some weight we can't tell from that but we actually have data within the registry and as we move on and do more analysis we're still quite early in the, the analysis for this project we could start to ask the question of for people who are not having to use a wheelchair, does body mass index predict whether or not they'll necessarily need one over the next decade? And we could start to parse out some of the temporal relationship. But studies like this, I call them hypothesis generating. They're developing questions that we as physicians now can go out and try to get answers to. Mm -hmm. Okay, here's a question um, about um, uh, Rosella Tupler, uh, who has characterized FSHD progression um, kind of, I guess, with a sort of very granular approach, I would guess, say, in terms of which parts of the body are affected. And we, we all know FSHD can affect individuals in very, you know, as you said, some have a more of a facial presentation, some have upper body, some have more of a lower body, starting out and so forth. But um, uh, I think her data is based uh, on this large Italian registry. Um, so I, I think the suggestion here is, you know, would it be interesting to include her, um, either her work or, or maybe the data set in this kind of research? Let's see what. Um. Yeah, it's, the, the easy answer is yes. I, I mean, obviously, John mentioned this, that, you know, we're, we're developing these models, we're, we're, have, we're creating hypotheses, you know, the next step for us is to get other data sets where we can validate the findings in other groups of individuals. Um, I think that the Italian data set would be a fantastic data set and, and maybe we'll have the chance to collaborate with them. It's a slightly different data set than, than the one in the US. Um, their data sets based on a, a, at least partially a clinician's examination of somebody where the one in the U.S. registry is all patient reported. Mm -hmm. There's a large registry that's somewhat similar to the U.S. one in the U.K. and we've been talking to them with, for an attempt to maybe join these data sets together to gain more power and larger numbers to do this analysis. And we're actively reaching out for collaborators right now. So we're hoping in the next year or two, we will be able to do this, combine some of these large existing data sets and, and look in much larger groups of individuals. Okay. Uh, this is a, a question really more about participation in clinical trials and studies. Uh, someone says, I, I was recently diagnosed with FSHD type one. I'm 69 years old and have severe symptoms of muscular weakness. Is my age an excluding factor in clinical trials? Um, the, the answer is going to be it depends. Um, when we think of clinical trials, and I, I think what you're asking me is probably for drug studies, it would depend a lot on, on whether one, it's a, an investigational drug, so a drug that's never been approved by our Food and Drug Administration or whether it's a drug where we already, it's on the market and we know a lot about it. Um, for investigational drugs that are really being used for the first time in people, there's often a lot of restrictions on who's in those studies. And it's mainly because they need to be able to understand the safety um, issues related to the drug. And so they try to find people who are healthier to start with. As the drug gets closer and closer to reaching the point where we're thinking about using it in everyone, they tend to open up those criteria to allow more and more people in the study. So being at an age of 61 won't specifically keep you out of a study yet. Usually the upper limit is either 60 or 65. Um, but the weakness may or may not, and it'll really depend on, on the drug and where they're at in their development 
program. But, you know, me as a clinical researcher, I'm very aware of this. I try as much as possible to be as inclusive as possible. One study is not allowing everyone in. We do try to design another study so we can make sure that we're not leaving anyone out of, um, out of this, the process. Okay. There's a question here whether um, the registry collects data on women and menopause because it's been speculated that menopause might accelerate uh, symptoms. Um, the, the answer is sort of. Right now, the current U.S. registry they collect someone's gender and their age. And from that point of view, um, you can see what's happening to people at different ages. And indeed, there's some data in the registry that's kind of interesting in that there's this, this notion in the field that women are sometimes diagnosed a little bit older. The separation between the genders does tend to occur right around puberty and it goes away right around menopause fitting with, um, I think, what, what the, um, the question asked. But in our current registry, unfortunately, we really don't have good data about either pregnancy, menopause, or any of these questions. I think you could do it. We could design a survey and then ask everyone in the registry. That's part of what a registry is for. But I'll also mention some other registries do have this information. And I know that the UK registry has it. And I think someone's about to publish a paper that will include some information about that. And so, yeah, I think it's fantastic questions. Um, unfortunately, it's not currently in the US registry data set. Okay. Great, thank you so much. Well, I think we're almost at the end of our time, so I'm gonna ask um, Beth to come back on, but I wanted to really thank Jeff so much for, for that today's That was amazing, that was really interesting. I, most of it went over my head, especially when John was talking, but it, it, it's good to know that, um, you know, that, that we've been talking about artificial intelligence and, and, and bringing the registries together for so very long and actually hear that work is being done and it's actually happening is, is really exciting. So thank you guys very much. That was awesome. <laughs> um, thank you again for attending our Sequester Camp webinar today and a very special thank you to John Hogan and Dr. Do Dr. Jeff Statlin. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, we're gonna be updating our Sequester Camp webpage with these recordings um, and with other information as it arises. So please check back there often. And what I'm gonna do now is just post the link to our Sequester Camp webpage in the chat so you can grab it and go look at it. Um, our weekly lineup of activities is really fantastic. Um, in addition to these Thursday webinars, on Mondays at three o'clock Eastern, we've got a weekly Zoom fitness training session with one of our longtime FSHD Society members and patient, Bill Herzberg, with his trainer, Mitch Wade, to see his progress in the last four years from um, not walking very well um, or able to raise his arms to where he's gotten to uh, today is just amazing. So those are really fun. They're only 30 minutes on Mondays. Um, on Wednesdays, Wednesdays at two o'clock Eastern, Belinda Miller is broadcasting her weekly children's book reading on Facebook Live. And then again on Wednesday evenings, um, our talk show celebrity Tim Holland back at nine o'clock Eastern is hosting his show on Facebook Live. You can also dial in and chat with Tim during his show. Um, so keep an eye out for an email that comes out every Monday announcing what the topics of the upcoming webinar is going to be. Um, and we hope to see you again next week. So everyone, please take care and please stay healthy. Oh, can, oh Beth, yes. 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 Um, in the last half minute, I did want to invite everybody to attend next week's webinar, which is on the topic of getting more sleep during restless times. And we know that sleep can be challenging for people with FSHD for all kinds of reasons, breathing issues, comfort, finding a comfortable position and so on. And so this is a, a wonderful uh, topic that we will have um, Naoya um, Ogaya from the University of Southern California. Uh, he's an occupational therapist and that's one of his areas of specialty. So join us next week for that. Excellent. We can't wait to see you all here next week. Thanks again for joining us today. Bye.